So this morning, uh, this is just before Christmas, which is a great time to do this video because this is going to be a historic thing and it's going to go out to all of the martial arts communities. Every style uh, will be able to see this and learn a little bit more about a man from Hawaii who is uh, now help me out on this, guys. Uh, Professor Chow, uh, I believe he was born in Hawaii. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Senior Grandmaster uh, Sedino? Yep. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, he was born yes. there. <laughs> okay. Um, and his father, I believe, was a Chinese national. Yes, he came and, over um, to Hawaii. Good morning, Great Grandmaster Rob. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Hello, Great Master. Sir. How are you? It's Professor uh, Cunningham. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little soggy, wet over here, which I don't care for. You know, when it comes to me and rain. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you, Great Grand Master. Good to see you too, Professor. I'm I'm excited about this, and I. Uh... John, you you get excited about everything. <laughs> yeah, I kind of do, don't I? That, he's I'm just excitable. <laughs> That's good. That's good, John. Thank you. Thank you. I like that. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, that's nice. Very nice to say. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Sonny, where'd you go? I'm still here. I'm just uh, <laughs> parking. <laughs> I'm still okay. here. Don't worry. Well, I'm still let's, here. Uh, let's introduce everybody. So, we have great grandmaster Rob Castro, who is the head of the International Shaolin Kempo Association, a very formal title. Uh, I've known Rob for a long time. Uh, I think Rob is a great guy. He was born and raised doing martial arts. And that's pretty much been your, your entire life is doing this thing. And, and great grandmaster Rob Castro has trained with Professor Chow and also gone to visit him at his home in Hawaii on numerous occasions, if I understand that right. Um, not necessarily trained, but have, we've had, uh, we've had a workout, you know, I mean, there's a difference between, when, when you say training, there's a difference between training and getting instruction and working out. Um, there's distinctions between the two, I, I would say. Um, we had workouts, uh, with, uh, Professor Chow, um, which enjo I enjoyed very, very, very much. Um, as far as, uh, the interaction, uh, with him, as far as on a personal basis, yes, uh, I visited him a number of times, uh, at his home in Hawaii, as well as him when he was visiting, uh, us, our family. Uh, here in the state. state. And then we have senior grandmaster, Eugene Cedeno. What's your, uh, what's your connection to Professor Chow? I know that we've talked, you told me that you did work out slash train slash know him pretty well. <laughs> I'll let you have the floor. Yeah, I met Professor uh, a long time ago. I was still a kid. When I was with uh, Walter Godin's class, he used to come by all the time. He and uh, that teacher of mine, uh, Kaju Kembo teacher, uh, got along really well. So we got to train under him because he would come and actually teach class uh, quite a few times. And then also when I was with another one of his black belts, Brother Abe Kamahoa Hoa, he used to stop by every, every so often and uh, train the class. But yeah, I got to know him really well. I was lucky. He kind of liked me, so we uh, got along really well. Nice. Nice. Well, we have a senior master professor, Marvin Cunningham. You've been training since, what, uh, from 69, sir? Yeah, probably around there. Well, and you're a... <clears throat> You're very famous in a video that was put out, uh, and we're fortunate we have the man here that took that uh, <laughs> that video 
of uh, Professor Chow, and Professor Cunningham at the CKC, and that was in 1982, I believe. Is that correct? I would say around there, yes. Okay. Uh, so Eugene, sir, uh, I listened to that and I noticed there was some rock and roll music playing in the background. <laughs> well, I originally taped it on um, eight millimeter. So oh. before what you're hearing is I was actually transferring the eight millimeter to VHS while I was listening to music uh, and my son was walking oh. around. So you were back was, home. Yeah, I was in my house when I copied it. Right. That's why right. you hear music in the background, because I was listening to music as I was transferring <laughs> the eight millimeter to VHS. So that tells you how long ago that was done. <laughs> right. Well, that was a, a while ago. Yes. And uh, was that Janis Joplin? Yeah, I was listening to Janis Joplin, among other people on there. So you have to be very careful when uh, it's some people were sharing the film that uh, nobody went after copyright <laughs> payments. Right, right. But so yeah, that's why you hear the music in the background. I was actually in my office copying the tape. And I think you might even hear some of that eight millimeter sound in the background too, that when the, the reel's turning. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I have to listen more closely. Um, okay, so moving on and we have Master Sonny Pabuea from Iron Fist Martial Arts in Winnipeg, Canada. Sonny, are you here with us? Uh, I am, <laughs> sorry. And uh, it's it's an honor and privilege to be part of the group because yeah. I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm just little old me here in Canada, so. <laughs> right, yeah, me too. You know, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still working to get up there just like everybody else and to be in the same room with these great people it's a huge honor and privilege yes. so thank yes. you for allowing me to be part of it right right there was absolutely one, i don't know if you've seen the video but there was a technique that i was attacking professor chow great yes. Professor chow and uh i thought the technique was i was on the ground it was a sweep or a takedown or something it's been so long but i was on the yes. ground and I thought his technique, he had finished his technique. So I was getting up, but he, mm -hmm. had, he had more to, <laughs> to add on. And <laughs> when I saw him coming after me, I fell right back down. <laughs> and uh, I stayed down till I was sure he was finished. <laughs> you might see that in, in the demo. <laughs> yes, I actually saw that video. <laughs> like I said, I can... I can understand because the first time Sifu Al used me, I can remember he forgot to tell me that when I'm down and <clears throat> I'm ready to give up or I'm, uh -huh. or I'm feeling the pain, you got to yell break or tap out. Otherwise, he's going to keep going, assuming yeah. that the fight is not over. He's in that fight mode, right? And And when that takes over, he doesn't even know what's happening. He's just going. Yeah, and, and we when we did that, we didn't practice it. Oh boy! You know, it was, uh, uh, and that was how it went down. Oh boy! <laughs> we were, but uh, he, I could tell, he had power in his hands, his fist, yes. arms. Uh, he was a man that. He had very, very good control, so I, I wasn't even touched. But I nice. he came close enough to where I could see and feel uh, as he was pulling his punches a little bit. I could yes. see that and see the power he had, you know. There, sure. And it was, sure, honor to, it was an honor to work out with him or to be on the demo with him. It was an honor. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, anytime you could do that with any of the uh, great grandmasters or oh, just, yeah. yeah, you got to do it. Mm -hmm. The way yeah. I was taught from my instructor right at the, at the hop is whenever you can volunteer, just go to the front of the line and get, 
get used, you could say. <laughs> yeah, and that's the same thing it was with uh, Great Grandmaster Ralph Gastro. Yes. Know, whenever he was doing a demo or having a conference or a seminar or something like that, well, mm -hmm. we all tried to be in. He always would ask us to be involved. We just wanted to, whatever we could do to further his legacy, you know, yes. we did. And of course, we learned a lot from that. And then when we went on putting on our own demos, uh, mm -hmm. from that too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and very well said. Um, well, now that we've done the introductions, um, I'd like to get to the small talk. And uh, the masters that are here with us know more about Professor Chow. And you guys have stories. And I just really love to just sit back like a fly on the wall and let you guys just go for it. And I've talked to all three of you. And so if the conversation gets slow, I may just interject something just to get it kind of going again. But That's we'll good. just we'll just wing it. And uh, like the senior grandmaster Sedinio said, let's just take it as it comes. Go with the flow. <laughs> Sounds good. Beautiful. Okay. Well, you guys, uh, you guys go for it. Who wants to start first? Um, I'll start. Uh, okay. My experience with uh, Professor Chow. Um, there were a number of different uh, times that we did uh, come together. Um, the very first time, I would say I got to meet uh, Professor Chow was when he came uh, to my father's school. Um, and it was a, a surprise visit. Uh, and I don't remember the year, but back then, um, when someone of that uh, caliber uh, comes to visit, uh, it may not be so much of a visit, uh, but usually it was a situation where, um, well, what it was, was Professor Chow was coming to um, close the school down, uh, is what my understanding was, uh, because of certain things that he had heard uh, through other other people. So his visit uh, to our school, or to, to uh my father um, was, uh, you know, leaning towards that. But once he uh, obviously saw what my father was doing with his art, uh, what he learned from Professor Chow, uh, even though my, you know, my father had created his own uh, art of Shaolin Kempo, or back then it was called Kempo Karate. Um, Professor Chow was very impressed and very pleased with what my father was doing. Uh, so it was a complete turnaround of what he was planning on doing. Um, so it was, it was, it was a, a great opportunity for our family, uh, for the school, and for Professor Chow to uh, all of us come together as one. And uh, then later on in the years, uh, my father had uh, invited Professor Chow to come to visit the family. Uh, we were living in San Rafael at the time. So there were a number of times that he came, visited and stayed with us. Um, we also got a chance to go to Hawaii and visit uh, Professor Chow there. And that was the first time that we, as a family, got a, a chance to work out uh, in Hawaii um, at his um, school there. It wasn't a, a commercial uh, facility, but I believe it was a uh, like a rec center type situation. Um, and it was a very, very interesting uh, experience. The, the idea of, of experiencing the power of just the, the, the individual, Professor Chow himself, um, just his R of of, of everything that he had, um, it, it was uh, amazing. It was like uh, 
I remember when we were doing, when he was going through the breathing. Um, it was like when I had visited the uh, San Francisco Zoo um, and had been in where the lions were. You could just feel that power when the, the lions would roar and when Professor Chow was breathing, uh, going through the breathing process, uh, the whole place was vibrating uh, of the power that he had. Uh, the man was just, I mean, he wasn't of a very tall stature. I mean, he, he wasn't a very big man, but there was a lot, a lot of power, a lot of, uh, you know, unbelievable, um, awesome feeling that we got from, and the experience of the workout, uh, that's when he had introduced us to uh, what we call now um, Thunderbolt set. the Thunderbolt set, uh, which was uh, an awesome awesome set that uh, we still practice today. Um, after that, I did get a chance to visit him at his home. And I remember the first time I did visit him at his home, um, I saw a bag hanging from a tree. And like most martial artists, you know, you see a little bag and see a bag hanging there, you're gonna obviously come up and give a little tap to it. Uh, depending on how hard of a tap you want to give. Well, I figured it was just a average canvas bag hanging there. So I went to tap it a little harder than I expected. And it felt like a solid concrete bag that I was hitting. And that's what Professor Chow would work out on. Um, because it was outside, you know, exposed to the elements, the sand that was in it was completely compact compacted and uh you know that was his punching bag you know there was no cushion no uh padding no nothing between uh between the surface of that bag and whatever was in it um i do remember when uh in his home when we were speaking uh just just various situations uh just small talk um he did um show me some breaking. Uh, he demonstrated brick breaking. Um, he took a the average size of a brick, but actually half of it, it was already broken and just held one of it was supported by the floor and the other one was supported by his, uh, his left hand uh, on his palm. And all he did was just emphasize a simple uh, palm strike to half of that brick, uh, I wouldn't, without any problem, snapped it in half. So again, emphasizing the idea of the man having the power, uh, I definitely would not want to be on the other end of those fists, of those hands, um, in an altercation with him, that's for sure. Yes. I, I you know, again, spending time, spending that time to, to visit with him, him being uh, visiting our family uh, was a, an awesome opportunity um, to to get to know him, and uh, he was a very quiet uh, man. Uh, you know, again, uh, wouldn't want to see or meet him in a dark alley anywhere, or have any type of confrontation with him. Um, very respectful in, in both way, both back and forth. Uh, beautiful man. I loved him. He was, uh, yes. it's, it was, uh, sad, uh, you know, uh, situation that he was in financially and, uh, my father, as well as, uh, myself or our family, uh, was always trying to, uh, give him a, a helping hand in that situation. I remember, uh, Professor Chow, uh, at that workout that great grandmaster Rob was speaking and uh, that was, we were going to learn a new set, and that was the Thunderbolt set, and which we still practice. It's an advanced, very, very advanced set. And uh, the thing that impressed me about him, he remembered me from the demo that we did. This is years down the road after the demo, and he was at our uh, workout at our at the school. And uh, he, uh, a couple of things, he was, 
demonstrating the punch in. I was so impressed with his punching ability and his speed. Uh, I was taller than Professor Chow and and I weighed a, more than he did, but he had no problem as I was attacking him with, uh, we have the club technique and we take each other, throw each other against the wall. It was a wall in our school and we practiced wall attacks. Anyway, he had no problem lifting me off the ground and throwing me into the wall with control. I didn't break any bones. He did, but that's the way we worked out with contact, but control contact. And uh, I was impressed with, like I said, his hands were uh, almost to me looked like sledgehammer. They were strong. And uh, he was a very nice man. I like talking with them and uh he uh would help me at that time with certain type of punch for the technique that we were doing uh and uh i really appreciated that you know those were the only times that i saw a couple of times that he came to the school and that's my take remembering who he was and he was just a good man martial artist to talk to and and listen and he had a sense of humor i you know uh and we just laugh and talk and talk about a technique uh it was just good and we missed him that would be my take on great grandmaster professor child no, no, I, I was gonna say uh I had those same experiences with him. And, um, you know, I was glad I filmed that because I remember when I was young, we never took pictures, which I, I kicked myself for, but it wasn't my choice. You know, photos cost a lot of money back then. Right. Because <laughs> you had to buy the film, take the picture, send it in, right. and wait. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I always tell people, take pictures. Don't do what, uh, you know, happened to me. Because I would have had pictures of me as a kid with Professor Chow. But, uh, you know, Professor Chow was, uh, I'm going to talk later first. He was very, very proud of Great Grandmaster Castro. Because yes, he was. I, rem I remember when I was talking to him in, uh, I think it was 84, when he was uh, telling me he was going to give his style to Sam Kuoha. And he said, you know, I thought about it for Ralph. This, this is him talking. But Ralph has his own thing, and he's doing a wonderful job. And I'm really proud of him. That's why, uh, you know, he was giving what he was teaching in Hawaii after that to uh, Sam Kuoha. So that's a pretty great honor to hear a man like that say, no, he's doing his own thing, and he's doing great, and I'm yes. proud of him. So I was happy to hear that. Now, my experiences with Professor Chow started, like I said, I, this was in the 60s. And um, he would come to our school, Walter Godin School at the time was in Kaimuki, and uh, just come and teach. Because whenever he would come, uh, Walter Godin would just say, yeah, the class is yours. And uh, some classes were fun. Some classes, you know, were a little harsher than others, but uh, he wasn't trying to hurt anybody. He's just, he's a powerful guy. And uh, it was always fun to be there with him because you're right. Yeah, he's, he wasn't very tall. He was a stocky guy. Yes, he was. Uh, and uh, he was always very serious in class when he's teaching. He didn't used to smile in class. After class, he might laugh, but not during class. And, uh, you know, he... he like uh, great grandmaster Rob said, that man, when he was in the room, you knew he was in the room. He didn't have to say anything. So when he was there, you know, everybody paid very good attention. And uh, one thing that I think I, I enjoyed a lot, because he used to use my teacher as his uke. So it was fun to watch my teacher getting tossed around by uh, Professor Chow. <laughs> But, you know, I stayed in contact with him for a long time. Uh, in fact, all through the 80s, we used to talk a lot on the phone because I was living in the mainland by then. 
and at least once a month we talked on the phone and uh, again like was mentioned you know he didn't have a lot and so what I would always do every time we would talk I would send him a check with a little note saying, you know, this is for your time because I know you're a busy guy. And uh, that was just one little way of giving something back because uh, although he would come and train us, I personally didn't pay him anything. You know, to, I don't know if my teachers did, but uh, while I was an adult, you know, I wanted to give him something back and you know, he was always appreciative, but we always had a great time talking. And like I had mentioned to, to John, you know, all my different teachers always had different names for me. Some would call me by my first name or a nickname, but he always just called me by my last name. So it was always interesting if I walked somewhere into a school or, or even when he would come to visit Great Grandmaster, if I walked up to the dojo upstairs, then I'd hear him yelling across the room, you know, Sedano! <laughs> but I knew who it was, and, you know, and we want to sit down and shoot the breeze for a little while. So I was really lucky, that, uh, not so much that I liked him, I was lucky that he liked me. So yeah. <laughs> we could actually have conversations and not just be, like, you know, hello, how are you? Okay, bye. But I agree, I've seen him break a lot of things. And, uh, you know, that's be between him and his two of his students that I practice with also learned to break like him. They just trained their hands where they would look like they're just barely touching a brick and they break it. Uh, they, and again, it was Brother A. Kamahoahua, who was his top active student in Hawaii uh, when I started training with him in the, the later 1960s because we had moved to uh, Waianae. And uh, yeah, he broke stuff the same way. And then uh, he also trained Walter Godin and he used to break bricks that way. So I learned from them that you do either short snaps uh, with focus power or like uh, Great Grandmaster Rob said the other way, they used to like to just hold it in one hand. So it's at a slight angle on the ground and then hit it with the other hand. But they made it look like they were having a conversation with you. Like we're having a conversation now. You say, oh, can you do a project? And he might say, oh, yeah, you mean like this? And he'd be looking at you talking and do that. And the brick would be broken in half. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. It was just like, yeah, he was just grasping out of the air and just, ah, and that was it. Yeah. And you know, the conversation. Like, yeah, uh, no, like, yeah, no breathing, no setup. Yeah. They just and do it like, the end, you're like, what the heck? Yeah. <laughs> when he came to Hawaii to train, uh, that first one has a lot of the techniques that he used to teach us, especially when you're standing, you 45, and then come in with an attack because that was his favorite thing to do. They do a lot of them starting from the same position. Start, guy punches, 45, whatever technique we would do after whether it was a block and a punch or sometimes he'd step out of the way chop you in the ribs but he used to like doing those kind of techniques and that's what I remember him teaching us and because I saw that that's what me got, got me interested in the Shaolin Kempo because I could see Professor Chow's techniques and uh, that's what started my association in Shaolin Kempo and with Rick Alamy it's because I recognized Professor Chow's stuff. I could just see it. That's him. So if anybody ever said it wasn't, at least Monty Meets River anyway, that's the first, because I know that Great Grandmaster put together a lot of awesome stuff. Great Grandmaster uh, Ralph Castro. I remember uh, Great Grandmaster Ralph Castro had mentioned when he was learning, he was learning from Professor Child, those techniques that you were talking about. And what he did was take those techniques and make a form out of it, like Mount Meets River and, and put them into a form because then you could remember them a lot easier than just that saying. That is true. Yep. Go ahead. And, Go ahead. And he said he did that. Uh, Great Grand Master Ralph Castro had mentioned that to several of, uh, of the black belts. That's how uh, Mount Meach River came, and he, you know, from taking techniques and put them into a form. 
Yeah. And, and you know what? He told me that story too. And I totally understood it because when we used to train, sometimes you'd come in that night and uh, somebody might say, hey, you know, I was in a restaurant and such and such happened and we got into a fight. And that would start the teacher showing you techniques. And you not all techniques were numbered. It was just in his brain. He'd see something, yeah. go, well, do this. And then you practice that technique that, that night. You may never see that technique again. Or That's you true. may never see it for another three years. Yeah. So I totally understood when he said that. Because, yeah, if you didn't practice it on your own, you yes. would forget it. Yes, you would. So it made perfect sense when Great Grandmaster Castro said, yeah. So I started stringing the techniques together into a form so that I would remember them. And I... I totally understood that when he told me that story. Oh, yes. I did, too. And it made sense. But that's how a lot of techniques were born, I think, just from conversation in class. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm serious. I remember one time somebody came to class, and uh, they said, I was at a Chinese restaurant, and I was with my girlfriend, and then some guy took a swing at me. And in the class, this was with Walter Godin at the time. Uh, he would just grab a chair and a table and say, sit down, show me how you were sitting. And then he had chopsticks in the office because they'd have wooden chopsticks from just going out to eat. Mm -hmm. And then he, he just started making techniques. He said, hey, I'm going to show you how to hold chopsticks in your hand so you can punch somebody. And, and then if you're sitting down, this is how you should move. The guy, how did he throw the punch at you? What did you do? Well, you could also do this. You know, he would just move to the side block. And then he showed him how to punch the guy with chopsticks in his hands. So a lot of techniques were born just from conversation about something that happened to somebody. Yes. Oh, yes. So early Kempel stuff was a lot. There was some basic techniques. And then there was a lot of techniques that came from actual problems that people had in the street. Yes. And I remember you saying about you, when uh, Professor Chow, when I taped it, and you thought he was done, but he wasn't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, in Hawaii, we had a, a rule uh, because that would happen a lot. Uh -huh. So if the rule was this, the person who was... Um, being attacked, all right? You're the uki, I'm doing my technique. Right. You don't move, whether I threw you down or kept you up or anything, you don't move until the other person would slap their thighs. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way you would know that they were done. Mm -hmm. Because if you moved again, they would jump right back on you. And well, that's, that and that's the what, technique, yeah. That's what happened too. <laughs> but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't hit, I wasn't hurt. But you're right. Yeah, and the reason for that was so that you could actually see the body from a different angle. And if he started to get up, okay, what would you do now? And so you would just, you know, whether you knocked his hand out from under him or dropped the knee on him or whatever. Yeah. And I got beat up quite a bit because I would forget that because I same thing, I would start to get up and uh, like sit a suncheon or somebody would start tearing me up again. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, Professor Chow would do the same thing. They would cover, but he didn't really cover. He's just watching you. Yeah. And to see what you would do when you get up, because it's a different angle now. Now you're laying down. Did you get up on your right side, on your left side? And then, you know, so you could see a different target and then go back in and try some different techniques. Yeah. And he had plenty of I'm, techniques. <laughs> there were times when, yes, even when my father, after attacking him or whatever, you know, you think that the technique was done and over with, and you start to come up and he, you know, boom, 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 back again. And actually, you wouldn't get up until he gave you a little tap. Yes. Then he'd say, oh, then, oh, okay, it's clear to come up. I'll come up then. But yeah. And I, and I think it, it was obviously, yes, just uh, something that they, they learned through their training, through their previous instructors, that, you know, you, you may be in a situation where you do take a guy down. And you know what? He's going to come back up. You're going to be ready. You need to go back, take care of it, make sure he doesn't come back up. And it was just an automatic uh, thing that you did with completing your technique. You know, the guy, once he stays down, if he's going to stay down, you know, that's it. 
But if he starts to come back up, well, you know what? You may want to give him a little bit more. So <laughs> yeah. until until we were always, you know, tapped, whether it was uh, in the workout in the in the school or doing a demo, um, you you got to you know experience it. Don't get up until maybe you get tapped or until they they give you that signal that's good to go. So yep. yeah. And that was a good safety thing, but it's also good because uh, you could ad lib. You do your sure. basic technique, and then you get the ad lib after that, you know. And the ad libs would change in time because now you had more knowledge. So now maybe you want to do a lock instead of a kick or a, a break instead of a stomp. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, well, I have a question or a couple of questions. So moving back to when. Uh, great Grandmaster Rob was talking about Professor Chow coming over to the mainland and shutting schools down. So I had a conversation one time uh, with with your father, Great Grandmaster Ralph Castro, and he used to love to tell stories about Professor Chow and your mom and uh, uh, great stories. One of them was Bruce Lee and uh, Professor Chow, how Professor Chow came over uh, way back when in the in California for the purpose of shutting schools down. And I said, well, I saw that in one of the Bruce Lee movies where somebody or the whole, you know, the way I, I saw it was a group of these Chinese masters came over and we're scolding everybody and we don't like what you're doing. We're going to shut you down. <laughs> <laughs>